Greetings, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Cheryl Jenison DeProza, and I'm joined by my friend and colleague, Gino Sigismondi. And today, Gino is going to be taking us through microphone selection and placement for houses of worship. Uh, but before we get into that, just a few items of housekeeping. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for on-demand viewing. It usually takes us a couple of business days to get it ready, but once it's ready, it will be available at sure.com slash webinars. And that's a great website to go to to see all of our upcoming webinar events, and we have a couple more coming up in the near future. Future. Um, and it's also a great place to see all of our past webinar archives. So there's a lot of great subjects covered there across a lot of great audio topics. So feel free to go to shore.com slash webinars and see all of our great content there. Second of all, as we go through the session today, if you have any questions, please feel free to type them in the question pane. If you're joining us through the web, app, web application and you can't find the question pane, just look for the little question mark icon and you should be able to access it through there. If you're using the um, GoToWebinar app, or uh, app, on your, app on your desktop, you should look for a dark gray toolbox with an orange box with an arrow in it. Click on that orange box with the arrow and you can access the questions there. Please ask any questions that come up, but be advised that we will hold on those questions until the end of the session. And then just one last note, as you may notice from our webcams, we are not coming to you from our usual controlled environments. Most Sure Associates are working from home right now due to the current pandemic. So please be patient with us. Um, if we run into any audio or technical or, or connectivity issues, we'll work through those as best as we can. Um, but we are not coming to you from our usual controlled environments. So please be patient. All right. I think that wraps up all of the housekeeping. Let's get into the learning. Take it away, Gino. All right. Thanks, Cheryl. I would like to thank everyone for taking time out of your schedule to be with us here today while we uh, talk about this uh, interesting and important topic. And one that uh, this is a webinar we've done several times over the years. And it's it's always a, a good one to do. We certainly get lots of questions about the different mic applications uh, for different houses of worship applications. So we will we will go through this. And like Cheryl said, we'll take questions at the end here. And, and yeah, we'll get started. Um, we don't normally do webcams. It's a bit of a new thing for us. But I think it's kind of, uh, I don't know, this has been the situation over the last couple months has been an opportunity to, I guess, do things a little bit differently. And particularly when you're talking about microphone techniques, it's often illustrative to actually see the techniques as as you're hearing them as well. And so webinars are have always been great for hearing different things, and uh, now you'll be able to, uh, to to see different things as well. I'll mention right off the bat here, because this is often a question we get, uh, the microphone I am using is a Shure SM7B which is proven to be a very popular microphone for broadcast podcast type applications. It just has that sound that people like. So if you were wondering, uh, that's what this is is here. And uh, Cheryl, I see you turned your webcam back on. Do you want to tell everyone what you're using? Yes, I'm using the KSM8, um, which is a great vocal performance microphone and also has been working really well for our conferencing and um, webinar applications. So. And you've got the nice, fancy, shiny one. <clears throat> I do. And I think we're both using the MVI interface, correct? I'm actually very old school. I'm using the X2U, uh, which is still available, but is a slightly older uh, USB interface. The MVI is nice because it also works with your mobile devices too, uh, like iPhones, if you happen to like to record on those. Um, but anyway, before we get completely off track, so let's get into the subject here. Um, again, uh, just by way of introduction, my name is Gino. I'm in charge of technical support and training for the US uh, and Canada here at Sure. I've been with Sure 23 years now. So I've got a um, little bit of experience uh, with the company and uh, and with microphones. I'm also part-time sound engineer, part-time musician, uh, part-time lots of other things that are um, uh, related somehow to the to the microphone field. So here's what we're gonna do today. My, you know, microphone applications is, is a large topic and we could go on for for days and days about different things but i wanted to see what we could give you that would be most applicable and most useful in a, in the short amount of time we have together here today so we'll start with some microphone characteristics sort of the basics of mic technology and not just for the sole purpose of being you know being sciencey about it but really just because uh, understanding the basics of how microphones work and what those characteristics are are the foundation for understanding how to select the right microphones. So um, that's another major section of today was we'll be looking at some common 
applications uh, within the house of worship space and give you some pointers based on those characteristics for how to choose the right mic and how to how to place them again it won't be an exhaustive list there are you know lots of things we could we could go into we, we again we have limited time so we'll try to keep it to the major points and then we'll also have a little mythbuster section in there too um in the audio world there tends to be a lot of myths about uh, microphones in particular and how they work and what they can and can't do and how to best use them. So we're kind of hit a few of the major myths in there. And at the end, we'll just tag on just a little bit of some extra considerations when you want to go wireless, because that's, uh, again, a whole nother uh, layer of, of, of fun that uh, it brings to microphone applications. So let's delve into the characteristics here. So there are three important mic characteristics that we want to cover here. There are, of course, lots more specifications and things we could get into. But really, when you're looking at choosing a microphone, these are the three things that are most uh, important. That is transducer type, which is how the microphone translates sound waves into an electrical signal. Uh, polar pattern, which is how the microphone responds to sound coming at it from different directions, and frequency response, which is essentially, in a, in a nutshell, how the microphone sounds, right, or how it reproduces sound, I guess maybe is a slightly more accurate way of, of saying it. Remember, a microphone is really a very basic device, right? It, it, it really only has one job, and that is to, again, convert the uh, sound waves, which is, you know, the compression and rarefaction of air molecules, you know, as, as uh, that's what a sound wave is, right? A microphone's job is to take that sound wave and change it into a varying voltage that is analogous to the, the, the sound wave itself. So they're both waveforms, but they need to get from one domain into the other. And again, a, a transducer is just anything that can change one form of energy into another. So loudspeakers are also transducers, but they're doing the opposite of what a microphone does. They're taking that varying voltage and changing it back into variations in air pressure that we hear as a sound wave. In the radio realm, antennas converting a radio signal that is in the, um, in the electrical domain into a, a wave form that can travel or, or be receptive to those. So again, an antenna would be another transducer, even our own eyes and ears, right? These are all examples of, of things that do that. So, and it's important to stress this when we're talking about the microphone, because sometimes, particularly with wireless systems, someone will, will, will buy a wireless microphone because they know they want their voice to be louder. And then they plug it in and they say, well, well, it's not any louder. What's going? I don't hear anything. And that's because, again, a microphone does not make your voice louder. A microphone just converts your your the 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 sound wave that represents your voice into an electrical signal that can then be amplified, recorded, transmitted, whatever needs to happen after that. So the microphone is just that first component in the sound system that does that job for you. The three types of transducers we'll talk about today are dynamic condenser and ribbon. Again, there are many more historically. There's carbon mics and crystal mics and all kinds of other things. And even among these two, dynamic and condenser are by far the most popular. Ribbon is a little bit um, niche, but we'll, we'll mention it just because there's been sort of a resurgence of interest in ribbon microphones recently. So a dynamic microphone is a really actually a very basic device. It's a passive device, which means it doesn't require any power in order to operate. The three main components of a, of a dynamic microphone are the diaphragm, the coil, and the magnet. So really, that's all you have is this diaphragm, which is a very thin layer of, of mylar, typically, that uh, vibrates when sound waves strike the mylar. Actually, we've got an animation that shows this, probably easier to see there. And when the diaphragm moves back and forth, the coil of wire that's glued to the back of it also moves back and forth that around a magnet or in a magnetic field. And through the basic properties of induction, that means that as, as a coil of wire moves in a magnetic field, current is induced in that choir in that sorry in that, choir, in that coil and uh, that results in the varying voltage that you see coming from the output of the microphone and that's pretty much all there is to a dynamic microphone in terms of components sometimes there's a transformer and a and of course a connector on the output side uh, and the wires that connect it all together but that's really it and that makes dynamic mics have some of the characteristics that that 
they're known for, right? Which is being really rugged because it's just it's a simple device. They are uh, with no active electronics. They are very uh, robust in terms of being um, able to work in different environmental conditions, high heat, high humidity, low temperatures. Uh, they can be dropped often without any sort of damage. So that makes them uh, a really robust choice. They're also more affordable typically because, you know, because of your components in there. And uh, yet they still sound pretty good. I mean, you know, probably the most popular microphone in the world is the SM58. That's a dynamic microphone. And it's been the most popular mic in the world since the late 60s. So that I think that says something for dynamic mics and how good they can sound. Some of the downsides to a dynamic mic might be the fact that they can't be effectively miniaturized. They have to be of a certain size, maybe not as big as this SM7, but certainly as big as a Beta 58 might be, right? To to have a decent sound quality, that's kind of, you know, a, a physical restriction. So you never see really like dynamic lavalier microphones because you can't make them small enough to wear on your body and still expect them to sound good. And there, there's, there's a limitation to the frequency response, which we haven't gotten to yet, but when we talk about the sound quality of a mic. Again, some dynamic mics do sound really, really good, but they typically don't sound as good or can't sound quite as good as some condenser models do. And we'll uh, talk about why that is when we get to condenser microphones themselves. So there are some, some, some limitations there. But again, in terms of the balance of affordability, ruggedness, and sound quality, uh, you really can't go wrong with most dynamic microphones. A condenser microphone uh, is a little bit more of a complicated device. Uh, you still have a diaphragm, of course, uh, which is a still mylar, uh, it, often a, a metal layered, usually gold layered mylar. So it has a, a metal component to it. Again, very, very, very thin layer. But instead of having a coil of wire and a magnet, you have an electrically charged back plate that is behind the diaphragm and some spacers to maintain a tiny air gap in there, essentially forming which is what is like a miniature capacitor. And as the sound waves strike the diaphragm, essentially what you're doing is changing the spacing of that air gap. And in, a, in an electric field like that created by that back plate, uh, you end up with, again, the varying voltage that is the output of signal of the microphone. The output of a condenser element itself is typically very, very low. So you actually need some additional electronics inside of the microphone referred to as the preamp. And you can kind of see in the in the cutaway or the, the, the guts of this um, condenser microphone here, you can kind of see the, the preamp electronics in there that boost the signal level up and also alter the impedance because uh, the output impedance of a, uh, of a condenser element is also extremely high as well. So you need the preamp to do all of that for you. And this preamp, as it says here on the slide, requires phantom power in order to operate. So again, if you've never heard of phantom power, don't know what it is, it's a voltage that can, 48 volts is typical, but actually it can range anywhere from 11 to 52 volts of DC current that powers those electronics. And the reason it's called phantom power is because it doesn't require an extra power connection. It's not something separate you plug into the microphone. It just shows up on the mic inputs that you're of your mixer that you're plugged into or your interface or whatever is the next device. And most mixers, um, it's switchable. You can turn it on or off, but that's a very common uh, call that phone call that we get here in the applications engineering team at Sure is someone had a maybe they had an SM58 dynamic mic it was working great but they decided they wanted to upgrade to a nice condenser gooseneck mic for their podium they plug it in they don't hear anything why is this mic not working typically it's just because phantom power hasn't been turned on at the mixer some mixers in fact a lot of the more affordable mixers only have one global switch that will turn phantom power on for all of your inputs and the concern there sometimes is that, well, what if I'm not plugging condenser microphones in there? Well, phantom power will not hurt a dynamic microphone because it's it's balanced power. Essentially, it's if you look at the three pin XLR connector that are on most microphones, pin one is the shield, but pins two and three are your audio connections. And phantom power is equal on both pins two and three, which means that when the power, when that voltage hits a dynamic microphone, no current flow, so it doesn't hurt the microphone in, in any way. So you don't have to be concerned about that. But anyway, what's good about condenser microphones? Well, because you don't have that big mass hanging off the diaphragm like you do in a dynamic microphone, and I mean, a coil of wire might not seem that like that much mass, but to a, a sound wave, uh, which is relatively low energy, that that's a significant amount of weight that it adds to the diaphragm. 
that limits what's called the transient response of the microphone, which is how quickly the mic element responds to sound waves coming at it. So here, what you're looking at is a spark gap captured on an oscilloscope from the output of both a condenser and a dynamic microphone. And the thing to really notice is that, again, the condenser, you can see that the spark, it, it gets to its peak voltage faster than the dynamic does, because again, it takes more effort, I guess, for that dynamic element to get moving because of that coil of wire. And then also it takes a lot longer for it to slow down again, right? You've kind of got this ripple on the output side here that colors the initial frequency response. And that's why a dynamic mic doesn't necessarily sound as good as a condenser microphone. So condenser mics can be engineered to give you full range frequency response, right? 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz, which is the full range of human hearing, which a, a dynamic microphone can't do. And it's also flatter as well, which gives you a more natural frequency response, much more natural than you can get with the dynamic microphone as well. They're also more sensitive, again, because that less mass allows the microphone to be used for quieter sound sources and often at a somewhat greater distance, again, because that microphone is more sensitive. And they can be effectively miniaturized. So you can make a condenser microphone very small. Think of some of the theatrical lavaliers that are you know, small as a match head, right? Those are always condenser microphones because they can still maintain their excellent sound quality when when they are that small downsides well they're a little bit more sensitive and they do have that those additional electronics in there that require power could make them slightly more environmentally sensitive although i will say that a common myth get, getting ahead of ourselves into myth busters about condenser mics is that you know well they're too delicate to use on stage you don't want to drop them most modern condenser microphones particularly the ones from sure are engineered to the same quality standards as our dynamic mics so many of ours are designed to be used in extremely harsh environments so i wouldn't get over Really concerned about that. They do tend to be somewhat more expensive than dynamic microphones as well. That's just something to, to think about. Uh, and they have that issue of, of, of needing power. Ribbon mics, just real quick here, are actually just another form of a dynamic microphone, except instead of having a coil of wire hanging off of the, the diaphragm, the diaphragm is metal. Right, it's a corrugated piece of uh, typically some sort of aluminum or a, a metal aluminum layered uh, mylar or something like that, right? And that so when you, the sound wave strikes the the element, um, the whole thing vibrates back and forth inside of a of a U-shaped magnet, and you get that varying voltage again through the properties of induction. Ribbon mics just have a really kind of unique sound characteristic to them that is often described as warm or dark. Uh, they can tame kind of the harshness of a particular sound very well. Not a lot of op applications in live, which is sort of what we're talking about here today. So I'm not going to spend too much time on that. But if anyone has any specific questions about ribbon microphones, we can come back to that. So when we talk about how microphones pick up sound, you know, that, that's where we get into what's called the polar pattern. And the polar pattern can be basically broken down into two different categories, omnidirectional microphones and unidirectional microphones, of which there are several different types. Now, an omnidirectional microphone is called that because it can pick up sound from all directions, as illustrated by the, the globe you see on the left there. So that means it doesn't matter which way you point the microphone, it will always pick up sound just about equally as well. Now, there are some uh, good things about that, which means for people with sloppy mic technique, you can just kind of, you know, hold the mic sort of generally within the, you know, range of your mouth and it'll it'll pick you up and you can hold it upside down. But the downside is that it picks up everything. So particularly if you've got a like, lot of microphones on a stage, maybe it's a loud stage, then that omnidirectional microphone will pick up everything. And that can be problematic. Also, uh, microphones tend, omnidirectional mics tend to be a little more, more subject to feedback as well. And we'll talk about why that is later when we have a little MythBuster section on feedback. But just know that omnidirectional mics are more susceptible than uh, mics with some sort of a directional pattern to them. Unidirectional microphones, like uh, the cardioid pattern you see on the right there, are very typical of like an SM58 or even this SM7 that I'm using. And the SM7 uh, cardioid pattern um, is very consistent when you're directly in front of the microphone, or zero degrees if you're looking at the, the graph version there. And you can see as you start to move off to the side, the response of the mic starts to drop, and that's what I can kind of do here. So now I've kind of moved to that 30 degree position, and you can already hear that the level has dropped. And if I go 60 degrees, Degrees, it's even further off. And if I get all the way down to 90 degrees, I'm, you know, probably about at least maybe six to 10 dB down here 
probably yeah closer to six right so again you can really hear that difference in pickup from the microphone as you move around and i can't really do it too well with this microphone that in the back of it right you probably couldn't hear me too much and that's because that would be that dead spot of the microphone or 180 degrees off axis you're uh, probably close to 25 db down there you're it's not no it's not like there's absolutely no pickup but there's very little pickup so that raises an important point about microphones which is you know when you're using it people often want to know how far away you can get from the microphone but it's also a matter of keeping it in front of your mouth you know with a cardioid mic you've got a little bit of room to move around here but you can very quickly lose it as you get off to the side, right? Something that will just reinforce over and over and over again is the best sound, the best performance you'll get out of a microphone is when you're close to it. And it doesn't mean you need to be right on top of it like this, but you typically, you know, want to be within six to 12 inches of a microphone to get the best, uh, the best sound out of it. And we'll talk a little bit more about why that is in the Mythbusters section. Again, there are some uh, other types of patterns here. So you can also go to a super cardioid pattern microphone. Now I'm going to very quickly do a plug and unplug here so I can show you what a super cardioid microphone sounds like. One second. Okay. So now you should be hearing me on a beta 58. Sorry, that, that's probably in the way there. Let me move that out of the way. So this is a beta 58A dynamic microphone that is a super cardioid pattern. Now you might notice I already seem louder than I did before. And that has to do with the type of magnet that is used in a beta 58 that actually makes the microphone more sensitive. I don't want you to think that, oh, super cardioid mics are louder than cardioid mics. That's just a function of it being a beta 58. But for illustrative purposes, you can see now, as I start going around to the side, the sound starts dropping off a lot, a lot faster. I have, to, I have to remember to stay in the pattern here so you can actually hear me when I do that. So again, a supercardioid pattern is even tighter than the cardioid pattern is. So what that means is that the at the drop off happens much quicker as you start spinning away from the mic. So when you're 90 degrees off axis, you're already like 10 dB down and you can hear that drop pretty again, pretty dramatically when you're down here. But something of interest, the supercardioid pattern is you'll note that instead of having its angle of greatest rejection being 180 degrees behind the microphone, it's actually there's sort of two lobes that are right at, at some slight angles off from the back. So you can hear there's actually a little bit of pickup right at the back of the microphone there. It's kind of dark sounding. You don't get a lot of highs because the body or the, the grill of the mic and all of that, the, the structure of it blocks the high frequencies, but you can still hear me back here because of that little area of pickup. Um, but again, the, na the no, right about there. So um, so again, you got a little bit of a different pattern you need to consider there. Um, this is important too in placing like floor monitors on stage for a vocalist. If you have the typical sort of you know monitor right blowing directly 180 degrees in the back of a microphone, that's great monitor placement for a cardioid pattern mic, but not for a super cardioid where you'd prefer to have it more off to the side. So you're dealing with that no. And then you can see the hypercardioid to the right there gets even more directional and that lobe at the back gets even a little bit bigger uh, because really what you're doing is you're stepping towards what is essentially a bidirectional microphone, which is the nulls are at 90 degrees and there's equal pickup at the front and the back. Now, one thing we didn't talk about with directional mics is what's called proximity effect. And proximity effect is a boost in low frequency response that you get as you get closer to the microphone. And I'm going to demonstrate this with the supercardioid because it has even more proximity effect than a cardioid. And because it's more sensitive, I'll be able to do a gain adjustment here. Because what I want to do is I want you to notice how the low frequency response of the mic changes when I get close to it, but I have to lower the gain so you don't just hear it getting louder. So this is at about six inches or so from my mouth. Now I'm going to bring it right up close. Hopefully there wasn't too much volume change because that was a total guess on it. But you can hear the darkness, uh, which is that proximity effect. It's a bass boost that you get just from having the microphone this close to your mouth. But again, I'm going to go back, 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 all the way back here and try to keep the gain coming up. And you should hopefully hear a much different characteristic in the low end. And that's what proximity effect is. It's a effect, it's not designed in, it's a side effect of having a directional microphone. All directional microphones have this. Omnidirectional mics do not. It doesn't matter what the distance is from your mouth, the frequency response does not change. I'm gonna keep using this beta 58 here for the next couple of things, just because I think it's uh, it's uh, uh, useful, especially when we get to the Mythbuster section. But before we get there, I do wanna talk about frequency response, which again, is just how the microphone sounds, but it is something that you can, plot out on a graph. So if you've never seen one of these graphs before, what it's essentially telling you is that 
what you're looking at is the range of human hearing, at least in a newborn. I know I certainly can't hear that high anymore. And Cheryl could probably vouch for that too. You got 20 hertz on the low end, 20,000 hertz on the high end, uh, as far as what humans are capable of hearing. And the uh, then the vertical axis is the output level, the measured output level of the microphone at different frequencies. So on the left, that's what we call flat frequency response, which it's pretty obvious why it's called that. It's because the, the frequency response is, is equal. It looks like a flat line. It's equal at all frequencies. It's essentially what you put into it is what you get out of it, right? And this is the sort of frequency response that is wide and flat and very characteristic of a condenser microphone like a Shure SM81 or something like that. And you might look at this and think to yourself, well, wouldn't you want this all the time? Not necessarily. Keep in mind that different sound sources that you might be miking have different characteristics. In other words, not all sounds produce all frequencies, right? If you're miking, for example, well, actually pretty much any singer, I was going to say from a tenor on up, right? You don't really need a, anything below about 100 to 150 hertz or so. The human voice doesn't generate much energy down there, and you just end up picking a bunch of noise, you know, stage noise, vibration, wind noise p-pops all that sort of thing is in that low frequency area so if you are miking something that has significant low frequency content that might muck things up um, so as a contrast we'll look at shaped frequency response which again is called because the frequency response graph is now shaped instead of a flat line and, and you'll notice here that you've got uh, you know as a roll-off that already happens naturally within the microphone once you get below about 100 hertz which again is great for you know, vocal stage applications, actually pretty much all instruments except for bass, grand piano, organ, you know, those bass guitar, you know, those kinds of things, uh, pretty much anything else, you really don't need that kind of low frequency response. But you'll also notice a kind of a boost above the line where the microphone actually has more output when you get above 2000 hertz, all the way up to about six or 7000 hertz there. This is what we refer to as a presence peak. It's actually, the, this is actually the frequency response of an SM58. And that presence peak is what gives the microphone its sound that people actually like about it. Uh, just an interesting side note, the, the engineer that designed the Unidyne 3 cartridge that became the SM58 was disappointed that he was never able to get rid of that presence peak because he was trying to design the flattest possible dynamic microphone. But it turns out that that peak there is what made it a hit. Why? Because that's where the consonant range is in human speech. If you think about it, consonants, which are S's, T's, P's, D's, C's, those types of things, those are what allow us to understand what's being said. And if the goal of a microphone, particularly in a house of worship application, is to make sure that the message is heard, anything that boosts that 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 consonant range and helps with that articulation is is particularly in a louder environment what helps it cut through so the sm58 became a big hit with rock bands in the 60s because uh concerts got louder and louder and that that presence speak helped the sound of the vocal cut through so we we actually like that peak there because it helps where the, you know that that's where the, you know the the resonance in in the ear canal is around 4k right because that is where the intelligibility that allows us to communicate is vowels actually don't matter that's why when you whisper you can understand what people are saying because vowels are are uh, when you whisper you're not you're essentially just not creating vowel sounds, you're only creating consonant sounds. And then again, there's a there's a dip above 10K, which is also good because again, most thing, frequencies above 10,000 Hertz, if you do reproduce those, they might sound a little bit more natural, a little bit more real, but they offer nothing in terms of intelligibility. So in terms of just being able to understand or get a real full character of, of what's happening, um, you know, you don't you don't necessarily need those. But again, for a studio, for recording applications, for higher end things, it's, it might be useful to have those there. Ultimately, what you want to do is match what you are, the frequency response to the sound of what you're picking up. And so this kind of gets into what I was talking about earlier, right? Where if you look at different frequency response of different types of musical instruments, you can see that not many of them have fundamentals that go much below 130 hertz, right? You've kind of got, you know, cellos, bass drums, maybe a tenor sax might get down there. Of course, organs and pianos are very full range, right? Co condenser mics might be a good choice for those. But a lot of other instruments don't need that low frequency response. Or maybe if it's something like kind of annoying frequencies of a trumpet are in this, you know, range here, uh, which is, you know, that 4,000 hertz or so, where that actually kind of hurts your ears. And maybe you want a mic that isn't as sensitive there, like an SM58, maybe a ribbon mic would 
choose it. So that's why when we get asked often, you know, what's the best mic for X? It's like, well, you know, it, it really depends, right? It depends on the kind of sound that you want to get out of it. And that's why it's important to understand these characteristics. The last thing, just real quick here, that we want to we want to mention is again the electrical output of the microphone. It's just important to understand that you know you you want to plug mic outputs into mic inputs and line outputs into line inputs and not mix those two up, right? If the a microphone is meant to go to a microphone input that has enough gain to bring it up, right, to bring the signal up to something usable. If you end up using a line plugging a microphone into a line level input, you won't get nearly enough signal to barely even hear the microphone at all vice versa if something you're using has a line output you don't want to you don't want to use the line output into a mic input because that will distort it right so the chart on the right is basically just kind of giving you an idea of the different signal levels in dv like a dynamic mic versus a condenser mic the ksm44a versus a mixer which would be you know zero would be considered line level output and then these are all just levels that are below that right that's the most important thing to consider and the other thing you need to understand too is that a connector itself doesn't indicate a signal level type it doesn't have anything to do with the impedance or the signal level xlrs could be mic they could be line level quarter inch can be aux level or instrument level um, so you don't necessarily associate the type of connector with the signal level that's something you need to look at independently luckily most modern equipment you know mic mixers and things you can buy are, are kind of already designed with these basic use cases in mind so you typically don't have to worry about it too much but if you're starting to do things like trying to connect your mixer to a home stereo system uh, or your wireless mic to a home stereo system or you know trying to plug a mic into a guitar amp you know that's where these things kind of get a little bit weird but for most part you know mic output to mic input you'll be good as we were supposed to discuss on this slide, so I'll keep going. And of course, don't forget about the physical design of the microphone. Microphone comes in all different shapes and sizes for all different applications. Handheld, lavalier, headset, side address, end address, there's endless physical variations. And there's, again, there's no right answers. There's just pros and cons to each, which we'll discuss uh, when we get into the application section. But first, a little bit of myth busting. We'll go through this quickly. So myth number one, some microphones have better reach than others. They can pick up sound at greater distances. I was going to actually put a poll in here where we could see what the audience thinks on this, but I figured in the interest of time, we'll just, uh, we'll just, we'll just keep going here because the answer is kind of given to you, right? Of course, it's a myth, right? Microphones, again, are just, you know, I mentioned earlier, they're, they're designed to do one thing and they're really essentially a measurement tool. What the microphone is doing is measuring those variations in air pressure that, that are sound waves, right? They don't, do anything actively to go out and capture sound. Microphones can't work like a telephoto lens, right? Or a zoom lens where you can go in and make something appear to be closer visually. Uh, because sound waves are so much bigger and longer than light waves are, there's no way to practically make a microphone that can do that. That's all it can do is hear what it hears that's right in front of it. So a, a common rule of thumb I tell people is like, if your ear can't hear it, then the microphone's not gonna be able to hear it either. And again, why we talk about microphones not being able to reach out and get the sound, what that ends up meaning is that as you move the microphone further from your mouth, the sound level drops. It, it follows what's called the inverse square law, which means that as the, every time the microphone distance doubles from the sound source, the output signal of the microphone drops 6 dB or the voice level drops 6 dB. And you can hear that easily. Again, if I bring the microphone up to this probably two inches from my mouth at this point, and if I double it to four inches, let me see if I can do this correctly. Okay, that's about four inches away. Not very scientific, but you can hear that that's about a 6 dB drop. If I double it again to eight inches, probably about like that, now it's a lot quieter. And if I go back here, it's way down. Now I could try and compensate for that with gain on my mixer, but the reason you might not wanna do that is if you're in a noisy environment, you're just gonna end up picking up more of that noise. I thought we had a slide here, I guess we didn't. Picture there's a bunch of noise in between the microphone and the voice, right? And you end up hearing a lot of that. I guess I can illustrate that even just by snapping next to the microphone. Here, you can probably hear the snapping, but you can hear my voice pretty loud. But if I do this, now the snapping is much louder than my voice, right? So if that's any any sound that is in between you and the mic or even just ambient sound in the room, the further the mic is away from your mouth, the more you have to gain, you have to add at the mixer, which is the more of everything else you're gonna pick up. Now, of course, directional mics can help with that. So that's one of the advantages of a directional microphone is you can get it a little bit further away from the sound source and have it 
pick up less noise. And cardioid is better than omni. Supercardioid is better than cardioid and hypercardioid is better than supercardioid in terms of that. But the benefits are are small. Um, you can't, you know, you can't really get you know, that much further away. If you, if you go from a omnidirectional mic to a cardioid mic, you can be essentially 1.7, I believe the figure is times the distance away for that same sort of direct to ambient rate sound ratio. So it doesn't make a huge difference. The other reason to stay close to the microphone instead of having the microphone further away to try and reach out sound is because you can get something that's called comb filtering from reflections. So particularly, this is important to keep in mind when the mic is is on a podium, if it's too far from your mouth, you actually end up uh, getting multiple paths from your voice going to the microphone, right? So the mic signal goes directly or the voice, sorry, goes directly into the microphone, but it also bounces off the podium or maybe an altar, and that arrives out of phase with the original signal, and the frequency response ends up looking like a comb, like you see on the right side here. That's why it's called comb filtering, and that just sounds really bad. It's a very hollow kind of sound that's just really not pleasing. You want to, again, avoid that by uh, keeping the mic closer to your mouth. Myth number two, our pastor moves around at the podium. So we decided putting more mics on the podium will give us better coverage. Again, this is uh, a definite no-no because again, comb filtering, right? If you have two microphones picking up the same sound source at different distances, when those two mic signals are combined back again at the mixer, you get this comb filtering. So that's why you really don't want to have multiple microphones there. If you have a problem with someone who wanders or has poor mic technique and they do this sort of a thing a lot as they're walking around, there are two solutions. One, you can use two microphones, but then you want to use them with what's called an automatic mixer, which is a mixer that can actually is smart enough to know to only turn on one microphone per sound source. So if it determines that two people, I'm sorry, two mics are picking up the same person talking, it only turns on one of the mics. And if that person wanders closer to the second mic that's off, it'll just seamlessly, without anybody even being aware of it, switch to the other microphone. So you get the benefits of a greater area of coverage from multiple mics, but uh, you don't have to worry about these comb filtering issues. The other solution, of course, is a wireless head, head worn mic or lavalier mic, because then the person can walk wherever they want. The microphone um, stays consistent, placement stays consistent. So we talk, like to talk about what we call the three to one rule, right? When you're using multiple microphones, that means that for any unit of distance a mic is from a sound source, the next adjacent mic should be three times that distance away. So in the case of a choir application here, if we have, where is a very common application for more than one mic. If we have one mic three feet away out in front of the choir, the other mic should be nine feet apart from that initial microphone. And that will prevent you from getting comb filtering on your choir mics. We'll talk more about choir miking in a minute. And myth number three, if you're having feedback problems, you need to get a different microphone. Of course, that's not true. Uh, the microphone often gets blamed for being the cause of feedback, but it's not, microphones in and of themselves are not responsible for feedback. Feedback is a loop that occurs when sound that gets picked up by the microphone comes back out through the loudspeaker and gets picked up by the microphone again. That's what causes that squealing, howling, uh, annoying sound that we think of as feedback, right? And yes, of course, if you unplug the microphone, the feedback stops, but if you unplug the speaker, the feedback stops too. So that's what we mean about saying that it's not you know, just the microphone's fault. What the really the best way to avoid feedback is microphone technique or mic placement. So let's look at the steps here. And I'm gonna switch back to the other mic because now I'm getting tired of holding this one. One second, bear with me. Okay, I'm back. There we go with my SM7, which I love. Okay, here we go. So, you know, again, we can't beat on this topic enough, right? Move the microphone closer to the talker, right? If you are getting too much feedback, that is the cheapest and easiest way to eliminate feedback is just get people to move the microphone closer to their mouth. The other way, of course, is you can move the loudspeakers closer to the listener because the closer the loudspeaker is to the listener, the less you have to turn it up, but that's often not practical and or possible. Keeping the number of open microphones to a minimum always helps. Don't turn on all the mics all the time. Just only turn on the ones that need to be on, and that will help your game before feedback. Keep the, mic, the loudspeaker as far from the mic as possible. And um, again, then we get to using directional mics, right? And directional loudspeakers, of course. That um, That is a benefit, as I mentioned, 
cardioid mics are less susceptible to feedback than omnidirectional are. And then equalization or automatic um, automatic uh, feedback reducers, which are other devices you can get DSPs that will help with that. But you should always try all of those other things first. In other words, this is meant to be an ordered list of things you should do when trying to um, to, to maximize your gain before feedback. Don't just necessarily reach for the EQ right away, uh, or don't just think like, oh, I'm getting feedback. I want, I want to get one of those mics that doesn't have any feedback in it. There really, there really isn't such a thing. So that's kind of your list there. And again, we will go very deeply into that next week. Okay, let's get into the meat of the matter. Right now, we're just gonna plow through a list of applications and talk about the types of mics that are good for those. Starting with the lectern and or podium application, right, which is very, probably the most common microphone application in houses of worship, maybe next to the wireless lavalier microphone, but this has the distinct advantage of being cheaper than a wireless microphone. Anytime you add wireless components, you're certainly driving up the cost. So I always, and and I'm sure our, our sales department would hate me saying this, but if you don't need to be wireless, then don't buy a wireless. The, these microphones are very good and you've certainly reduced your complexity, provided you know you are standing at a, at a lectern and delivering your your words. So these are uh, almost always going to be a type of gooseneck microphone, which is what you see pictured on, on the right there. These are typically condenser microphones, which are useful because they're smaller, right? I mean, yeah, we've seen people put SM58s on big honking goosenecks and bolt that down to a podium, but it's not very pretty, right? So these microphones are much less obtrusive, and the fact that they're a condenser means you can make them smaller and still have them sound good. They are typically unidirectional, and that's an important I guess kind of side note here again when you have the issue of the sort of wandering pastor that doesn't stay in front of the microphone you'll often get um, I'll often hear from people oh uh, we should use an omnidirectional microphone instead because our pastor wanders a lot well that's not going to help you remember the only difference between a cardioid and an omnidirectional microphone is the fact that the omnidirectional mic picks up 360 degrees around the microphone but if you wander off to the side like that it doesn't really help you. You're still getting quieter because you're moving too far away from the microphone. So uh, unless your pastor wanders to the other side of the lectern and speaks into the back of the microphone, going to an omnidirectional mic, it doesn't really help there. But you would certainly want to stay away from a supercardioid pattern. A supercardioid pattern gooseneck mic is often not the best choice because, again, any sort of movement to the left or the right can cause a massive drop off in signal. So cardioid tends to be the way you want to go there. Again, that shaped response is useful because it helps with the articulation and gets rid of low frequencies that you don't necessarily need. So that's your typical sort of um, reasoning you would go with those sorts of microphones for that application. It also mentions that mic placement, you kind of want to be about a foot away from the mouth. You want to try to avoid going any further than that simply because, you know, it, 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 the signal levels gets, gets lower, gets weaker, and you open up more problems with feedback and ambient noise when you go too far away. Aimed towards the mouth, of course. And this is kind of an interesting one. A few inches off center, a lot of people don't realize that. And I should have had a gooseneck mic a condenser, particularly to Im illustrate this. But if you want to avoid that P popping, the P's, T's going through the system, people often again think that, oh, maybe I just need to put a bigger windscreen on the microphone. But the best thing to do is actually put the mic aiming towards the side of your mouth, right? And that is because the, the breath blast that caused that boom or that P pop go, it's a blast of air that goes straight out of your mouth. So when the mic is right in front of your mouth and you, you know, you probably can't hear that too much, especially over a webinar with the codex and everything, but to minimize it, if you go here, you get far less of it, right? So you do, you know, I always cringe when I ever see anybody step up to a podium and they grab the gooseneck mic and put it right directly in front of their lips. It's typically not what you want to do. You definitely want to have it off center a little bit. And again, general tips, one mic on at a time, Again, the gooseneck mic is nice because it minimizes those reflections. If you have the mic too low, too close to the podium, too likely that you'll get reflections. Pop filters are always a good idea and a shock mount, of course, especially if you've got someone that likes to, to bang on the lectern a lot. Now, in an altar application, which is typically you know lower, different sight lines, you often don't want a gooseneck microphone sticking up off the top of that. It's pretty unsightly, kind of ruins the whole, the whole aesthetic, I think. And that's where you might get into more of what's called a boundary or surface mount microphone, which are small flat microphones that are actually just lay right directly on top of the of the surface where you put the microphone. And there's a couple advantages to that besides just the, the, the visual one, but also from a sound perspective, you don't have to worry about that reflective comb filtering because now the 
the microphone is on the surface. So the direct sound, the direct sound waves from your mouth getting to the microphone arrive at the same time as any, the, the reflection would happen right at that boundary, right? So there is no comb filtering that happens with boundary mics. So they are definitely a great choice when you need something to kind of stay out of the way. Again, condenser mics, of course, because you need that sensitivity and that small size and cardioid is again, the way to go. Omni doesn't really help you here. And here's just kind of some sort of basics of how to place one of those microphones. What is interesting is you do typically need to place them a little further away from the edge of the surface because you'll notice that cardioid pattern, if you look at the side view, is only about 60 degrees above the surface. So if you put it too close to the talker, or too close to the edge of where the person is standing at the altar, they'll end up talking over the microphone. So you have to be far enough away so that you're within that 60 degree sort of vertical acceptance angle there. The other real danger of altar mics is I'm sorry, boundary mics is they can be covered, right? So you wanna make sure you don't put anything down on top of that microphone that will block the sound from getting to it. And also uh, surface noise as well. Again, because it's on the surface, if you end up tapping things or you know just kind of hitting things, pounding on the, on the surface, the microphone will be more likely to pick that up. So definitely watch out for that when you're using these. A Little bit of just awareness that, hey, there's a microphone here, watch out for it, can go a long way. Now, of course, as I mentioned earlier, lavalier microphones are very popular. You know, and you, you actually, I would say you probably rarely find someone that is willing to just stand there at, at the podium and not move around ever. And if you don't want to have a handheld that you're holding uh, and you want to have your hands free, there are two, two options, the lavalier microphone or the headset microphone. Typically, uh, condenser mics in either of these applications, because you want something that is small enough to you know be able to stay in place and not be visually obtrusive, in this application, omnidirectional is, is, is typically recommended because now you don't have to worry as much about where specifically you place the microphone or which way it's pointing. The lavalier mic will, will pick up from any direction. Right, and you also you don't you don't have proximity effect, which is is important because when the microphone is right on your chest, there's a lot of resonance there, and that proximity effect of a cardioid mic directly in your chest can give it a, a too boomy of a quality that obscures the intelligibility, and also there's minimal wind noise and breath noise artifacts from that. However, you might choose a unidirectional mic if feedback is a problem. If your sound system setup is in such a way that it's a, it's a noisy environment and there's a lot of reflectivity and a lot of that, that, that feedback occurring, then you might choose to go with the unidirectional lavalier microphone instead. Typical rule of thumb for placing a lavalier mic is about eight inches below your mouth. And what I like to do is, you know, kind of do this with my thumb and forefinger, put my thumb under my chin and go, the lavalier microphone goes there. That's typically a good way to, to think about it. Again, remember if you're using an, a unidirectional mic, you have to verify that it is pointed in the direct, correct direction up at the mouth and not off to the side. Uh, pop filters are essential, uh, particularly with unidirectional types that tend to be a little more sensitive to that. You really wanna have that windscreen on there. Also make sure you're kind of clipping the cabling so that it's not you know, loose or might get tugged or something like that or just unsightly. And of course, if you are using lectern mics, remember we wanna avoid that comb filtering of multiple mics. So if someone steps up to the podium, make sure you mute one or the other. It doesn't really matter which one, but you don't wanna have a lavalier mic and a lectern mic active for the same talker at the same time. Headworn mics, again, obviously what they are, tiny condenser mics, typically omnidirectional. And in this case, the game before feedback is even less of a problem because the microphone is right there up at the corner of your mouth where you would like it to be. There are dual types, single ear types, depending on aesthetically what you like. I tend to find, I feel like the dual ear types are a little more secure, but the single ear types are definitely much lower profile. These are a really great choice for game before feedback and sound quality. We are we are big fans of headworn mics here at Sure. And if given the choice, you know, if you have the option to go between headworn and lavalier for any sort of sound reinforcement application, if you can convince whomever you need to to wear a mic on their head or their face, the headworn mic is definitely the way to go. Not only because of the gain before feedback issue and 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 just a stronger signal, it's also more consistent. Keep in mind with a lavalier mic, when you move your head, the lav mic doesn't move. So you get that same effect that you hear when I do this in front of my handheld mic happens with a lavalier mic. But with a headworn mic where the microphone is here, right? When you move your mouth, the mic move your head, the microphone moves with it. So it's going to always going to be the best, most consistent sound quality from a headworn wireless microphone, sorry, versus a lavalier microphone. 
switching gears a little bit. I know we're going through these fast. And we want to look at choir microphones here now. Choir microphones, again, you know, a lot of condenser mics used in house of worship applications, if you haven't noticed. But for choir miking, where the microphones tend to be even further from the sound source, you want to use that condenser microphone. Also, now we're really looking at flatter frequency response needed here because you want to pick up sort of that full range of voices in the choir. And the further away a microphone is from the sound source, the more important it becomes to use that flat frequency response because you're, you have less proximity effect to kind of balance out that presence peak. And also in terms of feedback, the presence peak will start to feedback earlier when the mic is further. So you can typically get better gain before feedback from a flat response mic, which is definitely an issue when it's going to be further away here. Uh, there are a couple different options when you're looking at these microphones. On the right is more of a hanging mic, which is good for low profile applications. Sometimes people want to upgrade to something with a little bit more studio quality sound, like you see with the KSM 137 on the left. Either one is appropriate for miking. It just depends on, again, what you need from a visually aesthetic point of view and, and what your budget is and, and those sorts of things. But again, we want to look at that three to one rule, right? So when we're putting, because most choirs, unless they're really, really tiny, are going to need multiple microphones, right? So to avoid that comb filtering, again, keep the microphones about two to three feet out in front of the choir and six to nine feet away from each other. You typically want to angle it so that the mic is pointed, the most sensitive part of the mic is pointed at the back row of the choir because that helps give you a more balanced sound. If you point it down to the front, you're going to hear the front row much louder than everybody else, but keeping it pointed at the back row, which is furthest away, again, gives you that nice balanced, even sound of the whole choir. Now, a common common question we did is like, well, what if the pipe organ is right behind the choir? We seem to get more of the pipe organ than anything else. Well, that is a problem. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, microphones, they only hear what you hear. So if you're standing there and you hear the pipe organ louder than the choir, the microphone is also going to hear the pipe organ louder than the choir. The only way to really minimize that besides physically moving the choir somewhere else is to use more mics closer into the choir. And that's an unfortunate side effect of going closer in is you do need more microphones to get even pickup. But the only way to get better, you know, more direct sound of the choir is to keep the mics closer. It's a bit of a, it's a sticky application to get just right. Another thing we get asked about quite often is congregate microphones for the congregation. You know, that again is actually going to be very similar to what you would mic a choir with. However, I have to reiterate this over and over again, that this should only be for capturing the sound of the congregation for broadcast or recording or webcasting. If you try to put microphones on the congregation and reinforce that through the loudspeaker, it's a recipe for feedback because the microphones are typically in the ceiling too close to the loudspeakers, far away from the congregation because you're trying to pick up a whole lot of people and feedback will almost definitely occur. If the reason you're putting mics on the congregation is to try and get some sort of individual talkers, testimonials, things like that, you kind of have to use what we call the Oprah Winfrey method, which is a wireless handheld mic that you have runners delivered to those people that want to talk. And when people think, I can't believe that's the only way to do it, the way we, I answered that, it's like, well, Oprah has more money than just about anybody on earth. So if there was a way to throw money at this problem to fix it, she probably would have come up with it. That's, again, good thing to keep in mind there. Now, when we talk about musical applications and outfitting the praise team, that's a whole nother webinar that we just don't have time for today. Uh, just some general things, right? Vocals uh, for vocalists, singers, a praise team leader, et cetera. Handheld or head worn can work here, but you know, something that is, you know, close to the mouth. Again, dynamic or condenser largely depending on your preference, you know, unidirectional, that sort of a thing. Good shock mount when you have a handheld so you don't hear that uh, that handling noise. Instruments there, you can kind of see some of our general recommendations. I don't really want to go through these in detail here because we're running short on time, but we do have some great educational material on our website, including microphone techniques for live sound reinforcement and microphone selection and placement for houses of worship that go into great detail on how you use some of these principles to choose mics for different musical applications. Finally, special considerations for wireless. Again, this is brief. Wireless is a huge topic, and we have plenty of other webinars on our webinar page on getting into the nitty gritty of wireless. But some things I just want to leave you with to think about here. The most important questions you have to ask, particularly that first one is the most important, which is how many channels? When it comes to picking a wireless microphone system, the main thing that differentiates more less expensive systems from more expensive systems is how many you can use in the same room at the same time. 
So if your needs are modest, you only need two, three, four wireless mics, an entry level, more budget system might work. But if you're imagining someday outfitting you know, your praise team with 12 channels of wireless and 10 channels of in-ear monitoring, you better be thinking a lot higher end. So you always have to have that thought process when you're buying a wireless is how many channels do we want to use? Analog versus digital, that's almost kind of a no-brainer now because just about all wireless mic systems are digital, except for some of the most affordable ones. But digital wireless does offer the advantage of better sound quality that sounds almost just like a wire versus analog systems and uh, and some more advanced feature sets and just kind of smarts in terms of how the wireless works. Um, again, you want to look, uh, it's rechargeable batteries have become a much better option now, which saves you money in the long term. So I would definitely recommend looking for that. Rack mountable is definitely an advantage when you're using a larger number of systems. And that is because of this, our tips for improved wireless microphones operation whenever you're using more than two receivers sorry i skipped the first one position antennas for best line of sight that's really really critical you want to have your antennas in the same room up high so that you can see them you don't want to have 300 or 400 or a thousand bodies in between you and the antennas so get those antennas up in the air get them line of sight to be able to do that you need to use a rack mount receiver that allows you to remote mount antennas and if you have any more than two receivers, you want to use antenna distribution that allows those receivers to share one pair of antennas so you don't have a whole forest of antennas sticking up in the air, but just two antennas that are shared. Also, you want to scan for best frequencies. Um, most modern wireless receivers have the ability to identify a best frequency for you. Again, common troubleshooting call we get from someone who bought a wireless mic, they plugged it in, turned it on, and it, they're getting dropouts. The number one cause of dropouts in a wireless mic is interference. The best way to make sure you aren't getting interference is just use the receiver to scan for you. And then if you're using multiple systems, you need to take the extra step of ensuring that your frequencies are compatible with one another. And again, that's you look up our webinars on frequency compatibility, it's a whole thing, but it's just something to be aware of. Picking frequencies for your wireless is not a random hunt and peck, let's try these and see if it works. It actually needs to be actively coordinated. A lot of our smarter, newer systems can take care of that for you, but you definitely want to be aware of that. And then of course, make sure you always have fresh or charged batteries. And we highly recommend locking transmitters during use so that they don't accidentally get turned off. And then guess what? no audio. All right. Lots of great information there. All right. So now it's time for questions and we have a couple of them. Gino, are you ready for some questions? I am here. Yes. Fantastic. All right. So the first question we have is about proximity effect that we talked about really early in the session. The proximity effect, can you speak to the difference of if I start three inches away and I can keep consistent levels, e can I keep consistent levels easier than if I start right on top of the mic and then I move one inch and then I'm doubled or tripled the distance? Can, can you talk about sort of proximity effect and maybe some mic technique? Yeah, well, so there's, there's actually kind of, I think, two different things there because when we talk about proximity effect, as I was demonstrating there, that's really the... Um, the, the that increase in bass response as you change your distance from the microphone but it sounds like the question there is really more about the level change that happens and how you manage that which is uh, a great point so now now you're getting into what's called um the inverse square law if you want to get technical about it but what that means is that every time you double the distance from the microphone to your mouth you lose about 6 db of signal or conversely if you have the distance you gain 6 db right just to give you a point of reference 10 db is what is what most humans will perceive as like half as loud or twice as loud i guess if you're getting closer right so i guess the thing to think about there is that yeah the the level change is more dramatic when you're closer to the mic, right? That is, in other words, if you go from one inch from the microphone to two inches from the microphone, you've lost six dB. But if you start from three inches away, you need to go to six inches away to lose that six dB. So if what you're worried about is keeping the level that the mic is seeing consistent, it's actually a little bit easier to manage that when the mic is a little bit further away. However, if you're in a noisy, loud environment and you're trying to minimize how much extraneous, unwanted sound the microphone is picking up, you still want to be as close as possible. So I guess the way to sum that up might be the closer you are to the microphones, 
the more consistent you need to keep that distance is if, if that makes sense. Right. But if you're a little further away, you can be a little more forgiving in terms of that level change, but then, you know, you need to be aware of, of those differences as well. So hopefully that answered the question. Great. Um, okay. Next question. This is a product question. Does sure have any products for head worn microphones that do not have a belt pack, but are self contained for users who do not have belt or pockets to hold the belt pack. Samson is the only manufacturer I've found to meet that need. So we're talking about a wireless uh, like headset mic that receiver or the transmitter is built into the headset. Yep, that's correct. We Everything Sure makes is the separate headset and belt pack. We don't have that integrated one. Uh, so next, um, this is a little off topic, but something I think you can probably answer to. Um, for special events, what is the best type of mic to capture tap shoe sounds to play with a soundtrack? Presently using two SM81 at the edge of the stage with a low cut enabled um, with tapping on a stretched vinyl flooring over carpet, but it does not provide a nature reinforced tap shoe sound. Mm. Yeah, that's um well that that is that is a way to do it and maybe not um a bad way. Another option that is kind of similar but might be a little er easier in terms of placement is to actually use a boundary microphone, something like maybe our MX391 for example, which is a you know small flat microphone that is designed to sit right on the uh, surface of the stage there. You could put it right on the vinyl flooring, which since you don't have to deal with mic stands and anything like that, allows you maybe get it in a little closer, get a little bit better placement, something like that. Another more complex and expensive option, but might give you better result, is to use like an omnidirectional lavalier microphone that goes down the performer's legs. So they're wearing a belt pack transmitter with a lavalier mic instead of being clipped to your shirt is clipped to your sock or your the hem of your pants or something like that. And then you're in super close and uh, and can get get it that way. And then I guess the the really high end option is um, the uh, um, the uh, Q five X transmitter. Yeah, that's I'm, I say that <laughs> one more time. It was eluding me. Yeah, Q five X. Q five X. Thank you. Uh, that can actually be mounted like uh, if it's like a like a, a a woman's tap shoe that is like a heel, and you could actually like put it underneath the shoe there and it's got a little mic built in that's another option but that's that's getting pretty high end there so typically like i said either the boundary mic um or a lav mic uh on the leg is 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 a way to go awesome I have somebody here asking about other videos, links for other videos. There is a wealth of knowledge. You can find all of our past webinar archives at shore.com slash webinar. You can also go to the main Sure YouTube channel and there's a playlist of all of our webinars. And then we also have um, multiple uh, YouTube channels across our various different markets. Um, so if you go to our website, if you go to shore.com slash webinars, if you go to our YouTube, there is a a wealth of video knowledge across all these topics. Kind of, we dive deeper into um, gain before feedback. We dive deeper into wireless frequency coordination. We go into all sorts of things. Start at sure.com, poke around there. I'm sure you'll find something. And then if you have a question that you can't find a video for, you can always send an email to our support team by visiting sure.com slash contact and filling out the form there. So lots of great information. Um, start with our website. Okay, next question. I have a podium that does not have phantom power. What mic should I use? Is there a phantom power <laughs> supply that I can purchase? Okay. I guess the question I would ask back is, I mean, it wouldn't be the podium itself that would have phantom power, but the next, the mixer or the, you know, PA amplifier, whatever the next device that the microphone is plugged into should have phantom power. It's very rare to encounter a mixer today that does not have phantom power. That said, you can buy from many different manufacturers a battery powered phantom power supply. I would probably just Google, you know, battery powered phantom supply, and you would come up with something that you can then insert in line that will provide the necessary voltage. Great. All right, next question. Um, we're one of those churches struggling to mic our choir while trying to avoid getting blown away by the organ directly behind and above them. Currently mm -hmm. using two KSM 137s, choir is only 12 to 15 people, but are in two rows on the chancel. Any recommendations for the mics we should use for the more mics closer solution? 
those are good mics to use for a choir. So I don't know that there's anything necessarily problematic about the KSM 137. If you wanted to get more of those, that would be fine. I think the key is is like like we talked about, just get them in closer, and uh, and angle them in such a way that you know again you're you're minimizing the pickup of the of the organ. You know, th- this might be a case where. The more you can get them, uh, I think, higher up and angled down, right? Because think about how a cardioid pattern with that heart-shaped pickup, if you have the the mics too far out in front of the choir and pointed straight back, they're also then pointed straight back at the organ. But if you get them up higher and can angle them down towards the choir, that'll minimize, to a certain extent, the amount of pickup. Again, an organ is a loud thing. It's hard to not have it picked up, but again, taking advantage of the angle, getting them in closer, and you know that mic would still be a good option, just following those placement rules. Fantastic. And also, right. sorry, the KSM 137 does have a built-in low cut filter. You definitely want to engage that, and that'll minimize pickup of the extreme lows that come off of the pipe organ. Awesome. All right. I think that wraps up all the questions. There's a question that we somehow missed or something that pops up in your head or something related to something different in audio and not just House of Worship audio. You can visit shore.com slash contact and fill out a form there to get in touch with our support team. Gino heads up a great group of Ladies and gentlemen that can answer so many questions. Um, They're just a great font of knowledge. Um, We want to thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you learned a little something. I know I always do. And we hope to see you on the next one. Have a great day, everybody.